to Food Biz Plus series of the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Kathy Joran and I'm the director of the Food Business School. Tonight's topic is Food Biz Plus Alzheimer's, a discussion with Dr. Lisa Moscone of New York University and Dean Will Rosenzweig of the Food Business School. In a moment, we'll get started. I wanted to let you know that as the conversation progresses, you can enter questions in the chat area on your screen. It's just directly below the, the photos of the presenters. And you can enter those questions at any time, and we'll be happy to take them uh, throughout the conversation. After the conversation ends, please uh, stick around for just a couple of minutes so I can share with you some upcoming information about courses at Food Business School for the fall and beyond. Thanks so much. And at this time, I would like to introduce Dean Will Rosenzweig of the Food Business School. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for that nice introduction. Thank you for joining us today for our conversation with Dr. Lisa Moscone. Um, this is our Food Biz Plus series, which we've initiated this year. It's an opportunity for us to have uh, timely conversations about topics of interest to food entrepreneurs and innovators. We try to bring you the most thoughtful and important change makers in the, the landscape of food. We like to focus our attention on science and technology that are transforming this food system. And Will, can you turn on your camera, please? Sorry. It is, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. It is on. Oh, it is. Can you see me? Hmm. Yeah, it's no. on. There we go. There Thank you. you. Hmm. Yes, thanks. Okay. I was, I, was, I was smiling at myself here. Um, anyways, I was saying uh, we are um, focused on really bringing you the leading uh, thought leaders and change makers in the world of food. And the Food Business School, we're embarking on our second year of existence. We've made a lot of progress. We're the new center for executive and graduate education at the Culinary Institute of America, a nonprofit college that's been around for 70 years and has focused primarily on culinary education and is now really embarking um, more broadly to bring um, that expertise, that core expertise in the educational community uh, and connect it to food systems, innovation and entrepreneurship. And these monthly talks are really our way of sharing uh, some of our uh, access to insight and, and innovation. And our mission really is to help uh, enable and empower entrepreneurs and innovators to learn how to uh, identify and build new companies and enterprises and uh, internal innovations that are going to address the very significant challenges in the food system and, of course, the major business opportunities. So we offer applied uh, programs that are suitable for people earlier in their career and also people who are already accomplished and are looking to develop new skills, um, new competencies, and, and new networks. So um, that's our reason for being. And tonight, uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, as you know, Dr. Lisa Moscone. She leads the um, Center for Brain uh, Health and Fitness at the New York University Medical School in uh, New York City. Uh, I've had the pleasure to get to know Lisa a little bit over the last year or so, and I've just been struck by um, just the importance of her work and, and the timeliness. I have now had a personal experience, as Lisa knows, with a family member with Alzheimer's, and um, you just, there, there's so many new revelations about how, uh, what this disease is, and what causes it, and Lisa's really been at the forefront of both the research and the application of prevention and therapy for, you know, for this staggering disability. 
challenge that, that so many people are facing. But Lisa, maybe as a starting point, just to put in context, you know, we over the last few years we've come to um, learn a lot more about the diet, the epidemic in diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease connected to diet and lifestyle choices. And there's been a lot of emphasis um, coming from all directions in public health, in medical community, in the insurance uh, world, in uh, the way we're now um, looking at these diseases and treating them. Um, I think one of the studies that I was involved in uh, quantified the annual cost of preventable um, expenditures related to diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease just in the United States near, at nearly a billion dollars. We know that over a third of the population has some dimension of diabetes or obesity. Can you put Alzheimer's and dementia in context of that overall kind of world of chronic disease and, and maybe give a bit of perspective of how you've seen it grow and change over the last few years. So I can try <laughs> for sure. Um, I think what, what's happening is that uh, more and more people are aging. So we are an aging population and as we age, we naturally become more susceptible and more vulnerable to all sorts of diseases, especially those that can affect the brain. But in particular, in the past decade, perhaps the past two decades, there's been a little bit of an explosion of diseases of affluence, which I think is what you were referring to, like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also um, to some extent that we're starting to understand just now dementia, of course, obesity as well. Um, what we put in our body makes a huge impact on our health. And for many, many years, we've been, used, we've been thinking about diet and exercise and lifestyle in general as related to um, something that happens to our body. So not just the way we look or can we fit in that pair of jeans or not, but really um, our lifestyle has a huge impact on, our, on the health of our body. But more recently, scientists and doctors alike have become aware that lifestyle has an equally meaningful and powerful impact on the health of our brain, which is really my research of the past 15 years or so. So just to go back to your, your point, I think what, what everybody's starting to appreciate is that diseases that once were thought to be almost unavoidable especially after a certain age, are now being completely reinvented and, and really uh, thought of as being preventable, at least in large part. And that, that's really a revolution in, in the health field. Like, mm -hmm. when I was in school, no one was talking about prevention, especially of brain diseases or um, diseases of such huge proportions, like diabetes or... or heart disease, and now, finally, the numbers are going down, you know, as, as people are becoming aware that they have a lot to say, you know, they can really take charge of their life and make changes, they can make them, they can keep them healthier, more than most people are embracing a healthier lifestyle to really take care of themselves. And that's a little bit what's happening also in, in my field, in the field of aging, brain, brain aging, really, and dementia. And I see you, you, you mentioned, you're showing this life. Yeah you, yeah, you mentioned that you, for the last 15 years, you've been studying brains, and you've been one of the scientists to embrace um, imaging of brains, to actually be able to look inside and see what's happening and changing. And, creating studies where you can actually compare um, the diets of one population versus another and see the manifestation of that in the brain. And you, you brought us a, some images to, to, to acquaint us with this, this work. Can you talk to us a little bit more about this contrast between the Mediterranean diet and the American diet and what's showing up and, and what's the yes. elements? Yes, exactly. This is... This is one of the of my very first studies when I started looking into nutrition and diet 
in, in their effects on the brain. For many years, I was, I was really looking at genetics. So what, what your DNA can do for you, what kind of gene can increase risk of Alzheimer's and family history, genetic inheritance. And at some point, this actually is a funny story, I was, I was giving a talk and I was saying how, you know, there's really not much that we can do pharmaceutically at this point because current drugs don't work. Uh, future drugs may not be available for like 10 years. And it was, it was a bit of a downer, <laughs> you know, I wasn't too happy. And then somebody said to me, okay, but so how about olive oil? I was like, Olive oil. And <laughs> around the same time, a lot of our patients and participants started really started asking the same question. You know, okay, if I I may or may not be at risk, but what can I do to reduce the risk to make sure I don't get sick? What should I eat? Like everybody was like, Okay, so what should I eat? And I was like I don't know. I don't know. Not because I don't want to know, but because nobody told me that in school, and it's not something they were us usually studying in school, at least not when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And so I really started to look into that, and just in terms of my background, I have a dual PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, so it's really like biology in a way. Um, and so I went back to school, and I got another degree in integrated nutrition, and at the same time I founded uh, the Nutrition and Brain Fitness Lab at NYU Medical. And that's when we started looking at brain, because that's what I you know, that's what I know how to do, but in relationship to lifestyle and especially diet rather than DNA and genetics. So this is the first study, and I'm going to talk about two brains, because this is really what we're looking at. These are the magnetic resonance imaging, MRI scans of two people. The person at the left uh, is a 52-year-old woman who is perfectly clinically and cognitively normal. She's doing very well. And her brain is like, great. That's the way you want your brain to be when you're 52. So what makes the brain a really healthy brain is that you can see the outline, the contour of the brain is really close to the bone. The bone is the little white ribbon um, around the brain, so it's really the skull. And inside the brain, there is a little butterfly-shaped structure, the tissues. These are called ventricles. And you want them to be really, really nice and close because they contain water. Mm. So if they were to get bigger, that would be an indication that your brain is shrinking. And so there's a lot more fluid that takes up the space in the brain. And fluid looks black on MRI. So that's like a great brain. And this lady, has been really following a Mediterranean style diet for most of her life. She's American, so I don't know if saying Mediterranean is really, uh, you know, it's not the same as you would eat in Greece or, or in Italy, but she eats a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits, uh, fish, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, very small amounts of processed food. I would say no fast food, very little fried food, very little sugary foods or soda. The brain to the right, instead, belongs to a woman who's actually slightly younger. She was 50 years old when, when she started in our studies. She's also clinically and cognitively normal, but her brain is not doing as well. I think it, it shows up on the scans that there's a lot more black inside the brain to the right as compared to the brain to the left. And that's because this, her brain has been shrinking. And so the skull, the brain is not as close to the skull as it should be. There's a lot more black around it. And also inside, so the ventricles get bigger. And also the structure in the middle of the brain, there's a, there's a red arrow pointing to it. That's the hippocampus. It's the memory center of the brain. And her are also surrounded by water. There's a little bit more black around them. That's a sign of atrophy. And atrophy means neuronal loss. So that brain is losing neurons um, during aging. And that's a big factor for Alzheimer's disease. Now, this lady has been following an American diet or a Western diet. 
for many years. So her diet is kind of the opposite of that of the other brain, uh, with a lot of processed food, red meat, high fat dairy, fast food, fried food, soda, sugary um, snacks, basically. And we, we believe that um, the difference is might be primarily related to the lifestyle. And these are two isolated cases, but what we found and was published is that on average, people who follow a Mediterranean diet have younger looking brains as compared to people on a Western diet. Typically, people who follow the Western diet, especially for a few years, they may have like 10 up to 20% smaller brain as compared to people on, on a Mediterranean diet. Not because they were born with smaller brains, but because their brains are getting, they're really literally shrinking over time. And you don't want that to happen to your brain. And, and Lisa, in the study, were there correlations to weight and body mass index, cholesterol, any other biomarkers that you studied um, in conjunction with this that that gave you yeah. insight or? So all the data uh, was corrected for all the markers that you mentioned, but the one uh, parameter that was correlated with that was insulin resistance. So um, at some point when people eat uh, a diet that is really high in sugar, what happens is that the pancreas kind of gets burned out. And so it keeps producing insulin, but the body really doesn't use the insulin efficiently. And so there's a buildup of glucose in blood that ultimately makes you insulin resistant, whereas you want to be very sensitive to the effects of insulin. And insulin resistance is a risk factor for pre-diabetes and, of course, also for diabetes later on. So it's a little dangerous. Actually, it's quite dangerous. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to get diabetes, of course. So where is the, um, what is the state of the knowledge of your work sorry, in Will? the practice? Yeah? Could I just what is, what is the question? state of the work? Yeah, sure. Okay, because somebody's asking, what is CBR and MMSC, which is a good question. CBR means a clinical dimension rating scale. If it's a zero, it means that you're clinically normal. You have no dimension of heart rate impairment. MMSC means uh, mini mental state evaluation, and it's a, it's a rating scale that measures the cognitive performance. The values go from 0 to 30. 0 is the worst, 30 is the best. So if you score 28, you're doing pretty well, 28, 29. Sorry, I just forgot to mention that. No, that's fine. Yeah. I was just wondering it, at the state of um, healthcare today, if we go to a doctor, um, yeah. like you said, this dementia and Alzheimer's was regarded as a disease of aging, or, yeah. um, and we would go to our general practitioner and they might refer us to, what, a gerontologist or yeah, um, a memory center or um, and how is how is that changing? I mean, it seems like there's an opportunity for a lot of um, innovation now in this in this area. Yes, opportunity for sure. I think at this point uh, the procedure has now changed. So the the standard um, medical care models for treatment of Alzheimer's is that your doctor sends you to a neurologist. The neurologist. Uh, we we'll do some tests, mm. like the CDR scale that I just mentioned. Um, most likely, they would order an MRI scan of your brain to see if there's any signs of ventricular enlargement, hippocampal shrinkage. Uh, they would want to rule out the presence of stroke or any other um, disease that could lead to the same to the same symptoms. So they would send you to a radiologist as well. Um, in I, I think the options are, are not great. They most likely they may give patients medication. At this point, there's um, 
a typical medication. It's called the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So it's a, it's a drug that um, increases availability of a chemical that's present in the brain. They will talk about this for the last slide that we have. Uh, so the brain uh, uses neurotransmitters to function. Um, in, in Alzheimer's disease, some of these neurotransmitters or these chemicals are reduced. They're kind of depleted. So the drugs that we have available make them more um, present in the brain for a longer period of time. The downside is that you're not really addressing the cause of Alzheimer's. Um, so in that sense, our options are a little limited. We need to have either better drugs or to really address prevention of Alzheimer's. So everybody at this point agrees that our best bet is to strike before, um, before the disease takes place. So in advance of cognitive decline, like years, 10 years in advance of cognitive decline. And I know this is a slide, which is... <laughs> so this is a little bit, um, it's a visual of the typical progression of Alzheimer's disease in the brain and in relation to cognitive symptoms. So for most people, uh, most people remain fairly stable um, during aging. Maybe some people, you know, they, they may have a little bit, they may forget a few things, they may not be as uh, sharp as they used to be, but most people really remain cognitively stable over the lifetime. Instead, for other people, there are genetic, lifestyle, and environmental factors that start damaging the brain when people are fairly young. Like we found, a fact, we found signs of that in people who are like 25 years old. So other studies have shown that the changes that lead to Alzheimer's disease can be detected at birth. Like literally in some people, you can, you can see them right away because of their genetics. And then these these genetic lifestyle and environmental factors really trigger a cascade of pathological events, so brain changes, that lead to the transition from normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, mild memory problems, forgetfulness, to an Alzheimer's diagnosis as people get older and then loss of independent function after dementia really takes over. Now, the good news is that most people don't show any symptoms until they're like 60 years old, or even a little bit older sometimes. Mm. It really speaks to prevention. Basically, everybody has at least 60 years to take care of their brain. And one way of doing that is really by focusing on lifestyle. Their lifestyle is diet, is exercise, uh, intellectual activity, social engagement, sleep, even. Uh, but diet is a major factor that really impacts brain health as we age. So we know that inflammation plays a big role in cardiovascular disease and other chronic yeah, diseases. Is, 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 yeah, it, so it is. It's implicated. Inflammation is yes. implicated in Alzheimer's and dementia. Yes. And yes, so do you, is C-reactive? C-reactive protein, a biomarker that you look for as well? We, we so, measure it, yeah. So we're at we a measure. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, so we're really at a point now where we see a common um, progression um, related to diet and lifestyle and some component of genes. Yeah. Uh, this is new. We thought that most of this was either genetically inherited or related to age. Yeah. Now, I'm relieved about this because my, my mother is suffering through my father, uh, was diagnosed with dementia when he turned 80, but his progression was quite rapid. And um, to now a, now a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, my wife thinks that it might have been catalyzed, she's also a doctor, but she thinks it might have been catalyzed by a small stroke or some event that just went undetected by the medical yes. system because it just, the onset was so rapid. Yes, um, that's usually about And she it. said to me, yeah, so the last visit I had with her, she says to me in her typical Jewish mother 
you know, New York accent says, I hope you don't get this. Oh, um, you know, and I think, I think she meant, I think she meant well, but you know, it was kind of scary because obviously, but what you're saying really is that um, when I think about the diet and lifestyle that I've had, it's quite different than my, than my parents. So what would a person, um, you know, in their fifties or early sixties, what would we do now? Is it, is it too late or um, is, if I go to you and have an MRI done, yeah. am I going to those that are going to make me miserable or, or am I going to be able to take some action now yeah. at this stage to, um, to live a long, healthy life or prevent, prevent or sustain the, the onset of, of a disease like dementia or Alzheimer's? Right. I, I think the answer is that it's never too late to take care of your brain. It's really important to start as soon as you can, but it's really never, never too late. You know, if anything you can do to improve the compound of your brain is definitely uh, more than welcome. In fact, there are studies showing that it's like um, one of the best predictors of whether somebody will get Alzheimer's or not in terms of lifestyle is how they live their life when they're like in their 50s. At least that, that's the evidence that we have. But um, the people who um, have clear risk factors for dementia and need a lot in midlife, they have a much higher risk of actually getting dementia when they get older. And this includes, for instance, um, high cholesterol levels. Um, smoking is a risk factor. Uh, there are many, many risk factors that can be treated, so diabetes, insulin resistance, uh, lack of physical activity, hypertension is a huge risk factor for dementia. In fact, since we were talking about cardiovascular disease as well, I think about 25% of all cases of dementia are actually related to um, vascular accident, particularly vascular dementia. It could be combined with Alzheimer's disease, it could be just vascular dementia per se, but 25% of all cases of dementia is a lot of cases. So it really means that we need to, to take care of our heart as well. And, and the sooner we do it, the better. There are many ways of doing that. You know, one, one way is to exercise. Many studies have shown that um, Aerobic activity is incredibly good for your brain and for your heart, of course. Other studies show that um, a very healthy diet is also incredibly protective. And since we're talking about uh, memory, in this case, the slide you just pulled up is really important, I think, to show. So that's, I, I was just talking about these chemicals that we have in the brain, acetylcholine. Um, so the brain uses neurotransmitters, about 80 neurotransmitters, to function properly. And neurotransmitters are the chemicals that go from one neuron to the other neuron, uh, transmitting information. When we think about memory, acetylcholine is one of the most important neurotransmitters uh, involved with the memory process, especially for memory formation and consolidation, but also retrieval of, of existing memory. And the peculiar thing about acetylcholine is that it's literally made of food. And that's because, so as the word implies, acetylcholine is made of acetyl group, like one acetyl group with it's basically sugar and choline. And choline is a B vitamin. 10% is produced by the liver, but 90% comes from the food that we eat. And there are recommended daily intake values. It's about 425 milligrams a day for women and 550 milligrams a day for men. So this is basically just enough to be healthy. So <laughs> it's good to know, I think. And most people, when I, when I tell them that, they would be like, oh, you know, it's milligrams. It's nothing. It's like a pinch of something. And they're like, uh-uh, <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really a pinch. So if you're a woman, uh, depending on the food that you eat, you have different choices. So in order to get your 425 milligrams a day of choline, you can eat three pounds of broccoli, or you can drink three liters of milk. 
you can eat a pound of chicken. Every day you need to do that. Or you can eat three eggs or just two tablespoons of caviar. And that's not to say that anybody should eat three pounds of broccoli because, you know, that would be the gastritis, most likely. <laughs> but it's to make the point that some foods are more brain nutritious and more nutrient dense than other foods. And some are foods that nobody really associates with brain health, like caviar, you know. But in reality, it's like an excellent superfood. It's really like probably the best brain food, or one of the best. Not just because oh. it contains a lot of choline, but also because of the omega-3 and, and phospholipids so that are really important for the brain. I saw a question in passing about fat for the brain. So I don't know if you want to yeah, let's let's get to let's weave that in, and then there's also a question about where should people be turning for um, lay audience <clears throat> expertise. Let's come back to that, but I'm really interested in this sort of, you know, what you found in terms of what the brain needs yeah. relative to what we're eating, and you know, three pounds of broccoli, a pound of chicken, um, that's going to make me weigh 200 pounds, and and two tablespoons or two teaspoons of caviar a day is going to make me broke. So no, <laughs> what are the opportunities here for food entrepreneurs um, to be thinking about fixing this, this disconnect between what's available to us, what's accessible, our habits. Yeah. Um, this just doesn't even feel within reach. Yeah. You know, and um, so how do you see, in, when you imagine making this, you know, convenient, delicious, accessible, affordable, all of the things that we've learned are essential to have food habits adopted. How are we going to um, really develop the next generation of brain food? Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. I, I think from my perspective, um, what research can offer is to really clarify which foods are actually good for the brain and why. Because I, I find that there's, an, there's a lot of confusion. There's really a lot of confusion. Like, when I started looking into this, it's because patients were asking me, what should I eat? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let me see the research. You know, the science says that you should eat this, 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 and that. And they would look at me and say, Absolutely not. I read in some book that I should eat a lot of fat because the brain is made of fat, and so I'm going to have bacon. I say, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? And so I, I really I started to understand how people don't read scientific papers. They just don't. They use the internet. They listen to the news. They... I don't know, they, they read things in magazines, and there's a huge disconnect between the science and what people get to hear about, which is really unfortunate. So I think, I think it would be great if scientists were a little bit better at communicating findings. You know, we're not trained to do that, but I think it's very, very important for anyone who wants to start a business that revolves about like food for the brain, for instance, it would be really great for them to talk to people who actually know the science and can guide uh, their decisions because depending on who you listen to, one day eggs are bad for you, the day after they're fantastic. One day carbohydrates are the enemy, the day after it's all you need to eat, you have to go vegan. So I think it's really important to to understand that there's um, popular science and science, and they're not they're not necessarily the same. They actually are very so different. If, if somebody's um, <laughs> so if somebody if somebody's very conscientious, um, say a member of our food business school community that really um, is intent on playing a role here to finding. Um, innovative solutions to this challenge, where, 
where should we be looking and following? What, you know, are there people besides yourself that we should be um, following? How do those of us that have sort of entrepreneurial talent, but maybe not the scientific training, um, collaborate or make sure that we're in environments where we're getting rigorous evidence to base our um, product designs or our plans on. Can you can you share some thoughts about how that might work? I mean, what comes to mind for me right now is I would love to maybe figure out how we could host a brain food challenge and bring you and your colleagues together to you know, translate the science and the recommendations in a way that we could figure out how to access the active ingredients in the yeah. foods that you've described yeah. and figure out how to craft, you know, on one end, simple recipes yeah. would be one thing just to be able to yeah. cook for brain health, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And at the other end, there's um, maybe functional or medical food opportunities that people could integrate into their diet that would give them, you know, evidence-based regular dosage of certain nutrients. Um, that might be one approach. But figuring all this out and figuring out what the business models would be for who's going to pay for this and <laughs> how does it fit into a preventive regimen of health. This gets very complicated, but... What are, what are your thoughts? You're starting now to move, I know, Lisa, from um, the clinical setting or from the research setting in the university, in the medical center, into clinical setting where you can actually um, meet yeah. with um, own patients to help um, test them, educate them, and yeah. guide them uh, on preventive tracks. Yeah. Yeah, and that's wonderful. One of the first things that I always do is to really take the time to explain the science to people. I, I strongly believe that if you just give directions, if you just tell people what to do, they'll do it for like two, three weeks, and then they'll go back to doing whatever it is that they were doing before. So it takes coaching. You know, you really have to work with people for a while in order to put a new habit to be formed. But at the same time, you need to provide education. I think it's so important to, to educate people. In as, as scientists, I think it's our duty, because it's not just about writing papers and publishing papers. It's really about sharing the knowledge with people who are not scientists and who don't want to be lost in the details of what we do and all our p-values and formulas. So something I... I enjoy talking about personally is um, how do we become more literate about science? You know, how do I really understand which studies are actionable with what, um, how do I, what can I do when I, when I find a new paper on the internet, when I, when I see these incredible news on TV, how do I know if they are really worth obtain so much attention to or not. So what happens to me, and it's been happening to me more, more and more at this point, is that at least once a week somebody sends me a link um, to some new drug that was just discovered where the headlines are like, you know, sensational. They're like, oh, new drug reverses Alzheimer's disease, or there's a new treatment that fully prevents the disease and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, oh, wonderful. You know, everybody hopes that, that something like that will happen tomorrow. I, I would be so happy about it. And so what I do, I go on PubMed, which is the website that all scientists use to read papers. I download the paper, I read it. And more often than not, it's a new drug that's been tested in 10 months. So usually I get back to the people who ask me the question, saying, well, you know, if you're one of those 10 mice, that's great news. <laughs> if you're not, it probably doesn't matter. So something that's really important and that not, not everybody's familiar with um, is that everything, like a drug, a supplement, a pill, 
even a, even a diet, they have to go through a very serious and rigorous testing. The best way to do that is um, through a clinical trial. There are many different kinds of trials, but the one that you want to shoot for is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. That means that whatever compound we're talking about has already gone through four different stages of testing. Actually, three. <laughs> two under uh, the supervision of the FDA, and they have entered the phase three uh, trial. That means thousands of people. There are a thousand up to like 3,000 patients in the study, so it's really big, like it has a huge population. It's a long-term trial. It's like a two years follow-up to make sure that whatever effects you see are actually there to stay. You know, they're not just something, it's not like the drug works for three months and then it stops. It has to work for at least a couple of years. Um, randomized means that half of the people are assigned to the treatment, are given the treatment. The other half, they don't know that, but they're not being given the treatment. They're given a placebo. And nobody knows right. who's getting treatment or who's getting placebo. The patients don't know. The scientists don't know. At the end of the study, once all the, you know, all the data is acquired, everything is completed, then we break the blind and find out who gets the treatment and who did not. So it's completely unbiased. At least it should be completely unbiased, very objective. At that point, you look for differences. If there is a difference, that's the drug that I would bet on. That's the drug I would take. I don't know if it's clear. Is it clear? So, Lisa, what other, uh, yeah, what other centers around the country or world besides the Brain Fitness Center at NYU are doing work that you pay attention to? Ah, so, well, so the lab, my lab is small. It's a small lab. We, we really do uh, pure research. So the centers I, I really enjoy following are a huge and so there's two in particular that, that I would like to that I'm happy to talk about. Um, so one is the Rush Institute. Um, the PI her name is Martha Claire Morris. They just got fourteen million dollars from the NIH to do a randomized clinical trial of the mind diet. The mind diet is a little bit of a hybrid, it's a combination between the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. The DASH diet is a diet that really helps against uh, hypertension. So they combine the principle of the two diets. They have some preliminary data that this kind of diet really helps uh, prevent Alzheimer's to some extent. But now they're doing a real huge, like a phase three study with uh, 600 uh, healthy volunteers of age 65, I believe, or older. They're going to be followed for three years. Um, half are going to be on the mind diet. The other half are just receiving some general dietary counseling. And about 300 of the patients are going to do MRIs as well. So that's really good. That's, I'm so excited about that. And also, another center that I personally uh, really like, and I'm consulting with them, is the uh, Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Cornell Medical Center in New York City. The clinic is led by Dr. Richard Isaacson, and they have, I think at this point, they have, they have been seeing like uh, 500 uh, people for prevention of Alzheimer's, and they're starting now to, to see some results, so that's going to be really exciting. As well. I so think with this um, aging pop, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I think you know we always encourage our students at uh, Food Business School to engage and track um, with credible resources and interact. We, you know, our our really our theory of change is that innovation comes through the cross pollination of different expertise and disciplines. So 
we do feel that there's so much um, opportunity for those people that have the, um, you know, the, the, the vision and the passion and the drive and the resourcefulness to translate um, evidence-based science into new products and services and um, approaches. And, you know, so much of what you're talking about also touches on the behavioral sciences. Um, which yeah. we, we haven't um, gotten into yet, but which we will have um, a Food Biz Plus session on that topic um, in the near future, too. So it just feels like um, combining um, an understanding of the core research and science as we learn more about brain health and the constituents of brain health and also the, the diet and actions um, that are implicated in, in brain health, and then also connect that to whole health, you know, our whole system health. Um, mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're learning so much more. Right now, the Culinary Institute's very much engaged in what they call the protein flip, which is, you know, finally the evidence over these years that plant-based diets are actually much better for us as human yeah. beings, and they're actually yeah. much better for the challenges of climate change and sustainability. But we know that 45% of all negative climate impacts are actually generated through the food and agriculture industries. So um, we know that eating less meat and producing meat in the, in the sort of industrial way that we've grown to on the planet, um, and then looking ahead at an, you know, a growing population and an aging population is just a recipe for disaster. So um, working with a number of the scientists at the Harvard School of Public Health, as you well know, we've um, developed through the Menus of Change program a, uh, a new recommendation called the Protein Flip. And what they've done is they've taken the science now, the evidence that's been developed in many places over the years about the benefits of plant-based diets. Um, and then working with culinary innovators and food service innovators and supply chain innovators have come up with all kinds of recommendations to effectively operationalize the science in a way yeah. that people can really act on it, whether you're cooking for your baby at home or whether you're preparing the meals for 30,000 students a day at a leading university. So... Um, I think that the, these, you know, these connections are very exciting, and yeah. you know, at, at FBS and, and CIA, and with our relationships with people like you and the scientific community, we're really trying to foster the kind of credible, you know, evidence-based discovery and invention that is, you know, that are going to address these really big, these big challenges. And um, I'm grateful to you for spending this 45 minutes with us today. And, yeah. and I think your outline of really how to develop kind of um, rigorous, skeptical, you know, um, uh, an eye for what constitutes evidence and what constitutes a media story is so important. And so thank you for that. And mm -hmm. um, thank you for all the good work that you're doing in the world. Ooh, we really thank you appreciate for your... it. And I hope that you'll... Um, um, Lisa will continue, you know, we love to follow Lisa's work and we will continue to share it. For those of you that um, don't get our smart brief yet, um, this is a good environment to be kept abreast of the, uh, the business uh, discoveries, the science discoveries, and something that we bring out twice a week um, and something that you can sign up for at the Food Business School website. So um, I think um, we could go back and just see a, a lot of our participants today have contributed some great ideas and suggestions and links, and we really appreciate that. Um, there's um, somebody, one of our, our, our participants, Joshua, said two FBS grads on this call are starting a brain food company called brainscubed.com says FBS has been invaluable. We would love to connect with you 
Brooke sent you an email not too long ago. So maybe there's an opportunity. Did, I, to don't, I, don't I, I don't think I received an email. I'm sorry. We're going to let. It's okay. I don't think I received an email. Sorry. We're going to let. Okay, foods cube, brainfoods.com. Um, they'll be in touch. But we're going to let you get back to Lily because it's probably time to put her to bed if she's not already asleep. And um, I'm going to turn prepared. it back to Kath. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping I'd get to see her. Anyway, <laughs> Kathy, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you all for um, participating you. tonight. And Kathy, why don't you let us know what programs are coming up on the FBS calendar? Thanks, Lisa. Definitely. Good Thank night. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Will. What a fabulous topic that uh, so many of us have personal experience with and so much to learn about going forward. So thank you again, Lisa. Really appreciate your time today. So I would just like to mention a couple of upcoming courses that Food Business School has to offer. We actually have six new courses on the docket for fall, but uh, this slide just talks about three of them. One which is an in-person course for two days called From Concept to Shelf that will be taking place at the Food Business School's new home, which is Copia in Napa, Napa, California. We're really excited about being in this fabulous new facility here in Napa. And that is on September 16th and 17th, and it's a really a course about bringing a product from concept to market and how to how we'll go about doing that. And then we have uh, a new online course called Eat, Think, Design, which is a design thinking course all about food products taught by uh, Jospal Sandhu, who also teaches at UC Berkeley. Really excited to have uh, an online version of that course developed by him specifically for Food Business School. And then another one uh, is the Essentials of Nutrition and Sustainability, which will be taught by Dr. Bruce German from UC Davis, all about um, nutrition and uh, sustainability related to nutrition and and the foods that we're eating, a lot about nutrition science in that course, very much like the things that we just heard about from Lisa, with um, a lot of things uh, similar to things like the microbiome, um, all food and science related uh, to our health and to the sustainability of our planet. There's several others as well, so please visit our website at foodbusinessschool.org. And also, if you are uh, joining us today, we would like to offer you a opportunity to have 15% off a of first course through FBS for attending our seminar. And you can just use the code which is showing on the slide there, FBS15. At our website, you could also opt in to getting the Smart Briefs uh, newsletter that we'll just mention to you. And we also have another newsletter that we send out about our upcoming courses. So thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it and look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully maybe next month. Our next uh, webinar here for Food Biz Series Plus is on July 6th. And we'll have Justin Siegel here from uh, UC Davis talking about food technology and policy. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.